I want to preach from this subject. Forgiven. Forgiven. Everybody say forgiven. forgiven. Father, may we do no damage, but preach that which becometh sound doctrine and gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Forgiven. In both verses, verse 13 and 14 respectively, we see the word forgiven or the word better, denied. Denied literally means, of course, and I don't want to insult your intelligence, but for the purpose of what I'm doing, I need to lay this foundation. Denied literally means to refuse. To refuse someone. It is not to know. Or not to recognize. To reject him. Either in the face. Of a former relationship. Or better. Knowledge. You learn something better. Or you've gone back to something that you used to know. You forsook or denied the current situation. To deny is to, to give up. All right? So we see where Peter says, you refused Christ. Or you rejected him, in the case of the Jews, for your former relationship. You held to Judaism. and You did not accept. Christ's message as being the savior of the world, as being the son of God, as being, being the Messiah. You denied him. And, and you denied him. You denied him on the day of Pentecost. During this, the Pentecost, leading up to the Pentecost celebration, should I say. The, not Pentecost, Passover. Leading up to the Passover celebration, you denied him. Pontius Pilate, to placate you, wanted to let him go for one of the ways the Romans maintained control of the Jews was that they recognized their special days. And it was their, the custom of the Romans on the Passover to let one of the prisoners go free. They had a prisoner whose name was, his full name, was Jesus Barabbas. Jesus Barabbas. The name literally means son of Abbas, who was a famous teacher, pronounced Barabbas. And you had the choice between the son of a teacher and the son of God. And you chose the son of a teacher over the son of God. And this Barabbas, Jesus Barabbas, was, you liked him because he was one of you. He was a rebel. He was a freedom fighter. He was a terrorist. He fought the Romans. And Rome had caught him and he was sentenced to death. And so Pilate, uh, Dr. Foster, Pilate tried to give them throw a softball at them. He picked somebody that he knew that they would uh, choose Jesus, the Son of God, over. Since all Jesus did was heal the sick, raise the dead, fed 5,000 with two little fish and five barley loaves, gave sight to the blind, caused the lame to walk, blind to see, dumb to talk, made a way, and then died for the people. <laughs> so most certainly, um, when 
you compare your choices, you most certainly would choose Jesus. He was not a rebel in the sense that he ever killed anybody. He healed people. We know you choose him over this lawbreaker. And to Pilate's surprise, they said, give us Barabbas. Pilate said, what then are we going to do with Jesus? To Pilate's surprise, they said, crucify him. Pilate's wife wrote him a letter, said, baby, and thank God for a smart wife. Pam have written me many little notes that have helped me greatly. Wrote him a letter and said, baby, have nothing to do with this man. He's different. He's holy. I've dreamed about him. He's not like the others. Don't do this. He's got a letter from his wife. He has, he has conducted a interview with Jesus himself. Jesus kind of stumped Pilate in the interview because Christ refused to answer any questions. And under Roman law, a refusal to answer the question was the same as uh, being guilty, accepting guilt. He asks Jesus, uh, are you the son of God? Jesus says, you say that I am. <laughs> That's what they say about me. Christ wouldn't talk for himself. Pilate threw questions at him. What is truth? And all of those things. And Jesus sat there. His wife said, don't do it. You don't want to do this. Not with, not, not with this man. But he had uh, a position. His position, life is something, demanded that he do something. We find that he wasn't man enough to break tradition. He wasn't strong enough to do the right thing. He was caught in a pickle. He wanted to let Jesus go. He said, I'm washing my hands of this. Y'all, you know, you if, if you want to crucify him, uh, they even tried to stop him. He says, now, uh, his blood will have to be on you. And they said, we'll receive it. We'll take it. But we want him crucified. And so, Pilate did it. When um, he was determined to let Jesus go. They refused Jesus. Still dealing with the word denied. They kept their formal relationship and they considered uh, their former, former relationship better knowledge. So they denied Jesus. I'm preaching about being forgiven. John's Gospel, chapter 8, and verse 32 and 36 comes to mind. You'll have to listen today to be able to follow me. In and out on this one, you're going to miss some things. John's Gospel, the 8th chapter, and verse 32 says, And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Everybody say free. free. Verse 36 says, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. In both verses, verse 32 and verse 36, the word free is mentioned. Free in verse 32, and free indeed, in verse 36. Pardon me for insulting your 
intelligence, but free. In our text, it's to, to make free, to liberate from power and punishment of sin. As an adjective, free is not under the control of another. Not subject or constrained. Free. Not subject to a specific or a specified thing. Free. Free is given without charge. Free indeed is here. Uh, the word indeed means really or truly or surely. So when Jesus sets you free, <laughs> you are really free, truly free, absolutely free, truly and absolutely unconstrained and unfettered. You're independent, free. This is why we, we have a strong following in the penal system. I give much love to my brothers and sisters who are locked up in the correctional system. They love our ministry. Men love straight preaching. Amen. Women do too, but uh, uh, fellas like it straight. And guys can tell when a preacher is trying to sell them a wooden nickel. And I'm glad of that. And I pray that you remain that kind of man and be those kinds of men. Um, there are men in prison who, although they are locked up in prison, they are free. In bonds, but, in, but free. They, they, they got to serve their sentence. But uh, while serving their sentence, locked up in jail, they're still free. They're free to be who and what God have made us to be. That's what Jesus gives us. Christ gives us freedom from sin. When we become saved, we're no longer slaves to sin. You have to admit, some of this stuff you were doing before you got saved, you couldn't stop doing. Praise the Lord. I told me and Rocky was talking the other day, and I said to him, I said, Clarence? He said, yes, sir, Bishop. I said, you know, I don't drink. And I've never been a drunk. I've never been an alcoholic. Before I got saved, I, I tasted wine, but I didn't like the taste of wine. I think what cured me was one day when my mama, before she got saved, uh, God knows how to work things out. There was some alcohol in a glass, and the glass had a green tint to it. As a little boy, I thought that the beverage in the glass was Fresca. Uh, you all don't remember Fresca. It's a soft drink. It's a soft drink. Like Sprite, Fre Fresca. I think Sprite ended up doing better than Fresca. They were competing. And I turned up the glass expecting to taste Fresca which tastes pretty much like a Sprite. And Judge was alcohol. That'll kill you. Oh, my throat burned. It tastes horrible. That one experience changed me from being a connoisseur of alcoholic beverages, except now it did take the blood of Jesus to get me away from beer.
looking back, the devil been after me all my life, and the Lord has been with me all my life. As a, as a younger man, I was dizzy one day. I don't know what it was. And I heard a voice tell me, if you drink some beer, it'll make the dizziness go away. And I went and got the beer. I, my mama didn't know it. And I drank it. And guess what happened? The dizziness went away. I said, all right. <laughs> so that, that, that worked. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So it took Jesus, you know, to kind of get me out of that. Point I'm making is the blood freezes. Old habits we drop. Things we walk away from because the Lord saved us. We're free. Not free to do what you want, but free to be who God made us to be. I want to talk so much. I want to talk so bad. I wish I could talk to uh, Kevin, uh, KD. I would love to have a conversation with LeBron James. I wish that I could talk to some of the professional athletes who are correct in what they are saying when they say God gave us the ability to play this game. Kobe Bryant said that God gave him the ability. All of them acknowledge God's gift. But a period doesn't go there. A comma goes there. Maybe a semicolon. He gave them the ability to do it and with their efforts to become the best at it so that they could recognize him. Take the platform and point people to him where they, have, where they are failing at. Uh, uh, they're not pointing people to him. See, that's what we're free to do. He's given us gifts and talents to be recognized by the Women of Color magazine. To point people to him. To be salutatorian. To point people to him. To build a, a financial empire. Thank God for Elder Ron Peoples. Looked up in um, um, Harlem, New York. And Ron was there on security waiting for me on the streets of Harlem when I got there. He's in the areas, got to Houston, Texas, and was there making sure your leader was protected. Amen. At his own expense, on his own dime. I appreciate that. Pastor James Parker with me in Harlem and in Houston. In um, Kansas City, Kansas, Chief of Staff, Tommy Eugene Quick, right there with me. And the mighty Stone, who just received his doctorate, my first assistant, now he's the Dr. Stone. Amen, was, uh, was going to meet me in Harlem, but how about this? Due to bad weather, they canceled his flight. But I thank God for these men using Amen. what God has given them to promote the kingdom. We've talked about the generous thing that Sister Retha Bogier, uh did, and that's just one of few things that she does. She uses her platform, her acumen, to better people in life and to point them to the cross. And will tell anybody, I get my business plan from listening to the preaching of the gospel. See, that, that's how it works. It's, to, it's the next step. Some of us stop short of the next step. See, you, you're good at what you do, but God makes you good to point people to him, Dr. Ojinga Harris and his lovely wife, doctors, uh, and do a tremendous job 
Oh, my God. Serving people, helping people uh, in, in their given field. Awesome men and women of God in their profession, but they point people to the cross. This is what free means. Free to show people who Jesus is. Are you following me? If you're not using your gifts and talents for the Lord, then you're not using them properly. It's a waste of time. Amen. If, if, the, if you use your gifts and talents to make yourself rich, to make yourself famous, to build an empire for yourself, that may work. But when you stand before God, you'll get no credit. You'll get no reward. Because he wants to know, what did you do for me? So this is what we're free. We're free to point people to Jesus Christ. Are you following me? Amen. It is freedom, according to Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, the last clause, to walk in the newness of life. Qualitatively new. Sometimes the situations are the same. But your life is new. Amen. It doesn't, the sin that you got delivered from, it doesn't bother you anymore. You're free. You're past it. You are absolutely free in your heart, mind, and conscience. As a result of Christ's forgiveness, I'm Free. Do I have any free people in here? Amen. And not only are we free as a result of Christ's forgiveness, but we become free when we forgive others. There's no point in being vindictive. There's no point in holding grudges. Some of you, you're good people, but you're too vindictive. You don't let things go. It may, you'll bring it up six years later. You wait for opportunities to insert. Ask God to forgive you and to deliver you from that because it keeps you there. See, when you forgive somebody, forgiveness frees you. Amen. As long as you hold it, it holds you. As long as you're mad about what your daddy did or what your mama did or what that person did to you eight years ago, you're still there. Now, they, on the other hand, if the Lord has forgiven them and they have forgiven themselves, they're free. And you look at them and say, Why can, how could they seem to be so happy and, and not bothered about knowing what they did to me? Well, they apologize to you. And they ask God to forgive them. And they've moved on. But if you hold it, then you're the one. You're the one who is trapped. You're trapped uh, in the past. You are trapped in an event. You are still living in 1963. One of the challenges I have with many of our brethren who fight for the, the advancement of colored people is that sometimes they lie and they say, nothing has changed. You hurt yourself when you don't acknowledge the advancements. Oh, we know America has changed. I don't, I don't, have, to, I don't have to cite, I don't have to cite uh, many things to tell you America has changed. All they have to do is just tell you, go to the mall. Go to the mall. You'll see the change in America. All these black boys walk around the mall holding hands with white women. I'm, I'm going to move on. I'll say anything else. Ask Emmett Till's mother. Has time changed? Times changed. He was falsely accused of whistling at a white woman. And they killed him. Times have changed. And thank God for the change. But you hurt your argument when you refuse to recognize the change. 
the progression. Don't you live in yesterday. Forgive. In this fight to save unborn babies, I'm always troubled when I see someone crying about an abortion as bad as it is, as hard as we fight to uh, prevent abortions. I'm troubled when a person cries about an abortion 20 years later, 30 years later. That doesn't help your argument. It hurts your argument. For it says to the listener that you have not accepted Christ's forgiveness. You are still there. And the thing, the, 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 the problem about with not accepting forgiveness is whatever you're trapped in, you're much more likely to repeat it. Right, right. Well, I can't, I can't forgive myself for being unfaithful to my husband or being unfaithful to my wife. That raises the likelihood that you'll do it again because you're still there. It's quiet in here. I told you this is one of those messages that you got to listen to. Now, you didn't expect me to come because I've been preaching out to show up without a message, did you? Amen. God speaks. God speaks. Amen. God speaks. When you have time, you make time. I work. I love to work. I love to earn my way. Somebody asked me one time, I said, what does your church give you? I said, nothing. I said, you don't get a salary? I said, that ain't what you asked. You ask me what do they give me? I'm not a freebie. I'm no, I'm no charity case. I'm a professional. I bring to the table qualifications. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm gonna preach in just a minute. See now, listen to this. See free. You got to forgive. Jesus taught us in Matthew 6 and 12 says, in, his, in, in the prayer that he taught the disciples, he said, uh, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. You know what Matthew 18 tells us about forgiveness? I'm building this now. You got to follow me. Amen. Sermons like this, I can preach better at home than out because you're trained to follow. Matthew's gospel, chapter 18, on the issue of forgiveness. Verse 21, then came Peter and said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother that sinned against me? Notice what he didn't ask. He didn't ask, how often should my brother forgive me when I sin against him? See, that's, that's the problem. That's the problem. So we, we, we keep note of who sins against us, but we dismiss those that we sin against. That's the problem. All we think about is what was done to us. We spend no time thinking about what we did. See, this, this question, the, the premise is bad. Follow me now. He says, uh, how often shall I forgive him? Till seven times? Should I forgive him seven times? Rabbis taught uh, to forgive at least three times. That was the rabbi's teaching. They sinned against you in a day at least three times. So Peter thought the offer to forgive seven times was a generous offer. And Jesus looked at him and, and said, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. There's no, if he, if he sins against you 490 times in one day, forgive him. The point is, it's, a, uh, it's limitless. Therefore, is the kingdom of God likened to a certain man. And he gives a, 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 uh, a parable about a man who forgave a man who owed him about a million dollars. And then the man went and uh, tried to destroy someone else who owed him, by comparison, very little. Saints, we owe God a million dollars. The person who has sinned against you owe you a penny. So how about letting it go? How about letting it go? 
How about not putting up bar requirements and all kinds of things before you can let it go? Just let it go. Jesus died for you and Jesus di died for them. Jesus died for all of us. So then, just as you want forgiveness, you must forgive. And walk in the newness of life. Everybody say, forgiven. In our text. In our text. Peter was speaking. And uh, it all began, really, uh, for Peter, about three years and uh, about three months or so prior to the text. It seemed to be just another day in the life of a Jewish fisherman working with his brother Andrew, living in the city of Bethsaida in the region of Galilee. The sun came up just like it did the day before. Fish were there as they had always been. Just another day. And uh, what seemed like just another day wasn't. It was everything but that. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 35 says, And the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Speaking of Jesus. And two of his disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. It is said that Andrew was one of the two. Then Jesus turned and saw them following him and he said unto them, What seek ye? He said to them, What are you searching for? Are you looking for another cause? It was, a, it was a loaded question. Do you really know who I am? What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which has been interpreted master, we want to know where dwellest thou? One writer said that they wanted to know, where did you come from? For you have been recognized by our leader as being the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. So our question is not, where is your address? Our question is, who are you? Where did you come from? There is something about the way you walk. You are different. During this time, Peter was doing his thing. Jesus answered and said, come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt. And they abode with him that day. Uh, for it was about the 10th hour. Around 4 in the afternoon. One of the two. Which heard John speak. Which heard John the Baptist. Called Jesus the Lamb of God. Followed and followed him. Was Andrew. Simon Peter's brother. Peter somewhere fishing. And he first, Andrew, findeth his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And look at verse 42. And brought him, brought Peter, to Jesus. And when Jesus looked at Peter, he said, Thou art? Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shall be called Cephas. You, you are Peter, but you are going to be called a stone. This was the first time that Peter was introduced to Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Now, for the second meeting that they had a few months later, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4. I'm building something. Are you praying with me? How many of you all love the Bible and love to let the scriptures speak for themselves? Yes, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4. We're going to find something, and Luke really tells us a, a story about this. This is the second meeting. 4 and 18 says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishers. And he said unto them, this was the second meeting, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And after having heard, John called him the Lamb of God. And after having met Jesus already a few months later before in person, the Bible says, and they straightway quit their jobs, left their nets, and followed him. Isn't that something? And then going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship and left their daddy's business and followed him. Can I get a witness? They didn't know in following Jesus. And if you read Luke, Luke will tell you that they told Jesus, we'd fished all night. Luke chapter 11, verse 5, chapter 5, verse 5 through 11, and said, we caught nothing. Jesus, I know, but if you just, it, look, if you just cast out just a little further and do what I'm telling you, you'll get a blessing. And when it worked, they said, we've got to follow this man. Read Luke uh, of, of chapter 5, 1 through 11 at your leisure. They didn't know that their whole lives were about to undergo changes. They were about to see experiences, highs and lows, and things that uh, they would nor uh, could have ever believed would have happened to them. Little did Peter know that he would, uh, as a result of leaving his business and giving up all that he knew to follow Christ, that he would be the recipient of one of the greatest revelations ever given to a human being. He had no way of knowing that the decision to follow Jesus would be one that will lead him and enable him to experience walking on water. Read Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 28 and 29. You'll see why Peter walked on the water to go to come to Jesus. And not only would he experience walking on water, but he would also experience one of the greatest revelations, you could argue the greatest, given to a human being. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 13, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Jesus standing there on the coast of Caesarea Philippi with six months more to go in his earthly ministry. The background was false gods, glistening false gods lit up on the, uh, the hillsides of Caesarea Philippi. Jesus stood there and said, who do men say that I am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say that you are Elijah. Others, Jeremiah and one of the prophets. And then he said to them, whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, this was something, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, 
Blessed art thou. Remember the first time he met him. He says, uh, you're Simon, but you're going to be called a stone. He says, blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah. This is three years later. For fresh flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven, hath revealed it. What a revelation that Peter received. And uh, not only did he receive that revelation, but also he would suffer a stiff rebuke. That same day, for in the same chapter, verse 21 through 23, uh, when Jesus talked about uh, going to Jerusalem and being killed, Peter, as was his tendency, talked too much. He got out of place. He tried to get, give Jesus counsel that he wasn't qualified to give him. The Bible says in verse 21 of chapter 16, from that time forth, Jesus began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and, uh, and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again from uh, the, raised again the third day. Then Peter, look at this, out of place, took him. He grabbed Jesus and began to rebuke him, saying to Jesus, be it far from thee. This shall not be unto thee. You're not going to be killed. You're, this, this can't happen. We won't let it. But he turned and said unto Peter, Jesus looked at Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou, ah, praise, excuse me, thou art an offense unto me. For thou sayest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. He says, you, you are a scandal. You are a stumbling block now, Peter, because you're using human reasoning rather than divine reasonings. But thank God, thank God in Peter's life, six days later, he recovered. For chapter 17 in verse 1 says, and after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and then bring them a high apart on a mountain. And he transfigured. Peter saw the glory of God on Jesus Christ and Jesus shined like the sun. Amen. And, as, and again as was his manner he spoke up when he should have stayed silent. Verse 4 through 5 then answered Peter and said unto Jesus Lord is it good for us it is good for us to be here you got to know when it's better to say nothing if thou wilt let us hear uh, make three tabernacles. Now, wasn't nobody talking about that. Where did that come from? Three tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. What a horrible suggestion. Do you know it would have ruined the church world had they had three houses built because some folk would be saying, I'm of Moses. Somebody else would be saying, I'm of Elijah. And somebody else would be saying, Jesus is my Savior. And the Bible lets us know that God wasn't pleased with him because the Lord cut him off. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed him. And, a, and behold, a voice out of, out of the cloud which said, This is, speaking of Jesus, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. That is, shut up. Peter, the inf this is not about you. This is about my beloved son. Praise the Lord. Now, I can't cover everything that happened in Peter's life. I don't have time to preach it all. Maybe I need another shut in. And, uh, uh, but uh, but let, me see, let me show you this. We see Peter as we progress in a low place. Although he didn't know that he was in a low place. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, 
and verse 31. You know, when you come to upper room, you have to bring your, bring your Bibles. If you bring your Bible, you'll enjoy this. If you didn't bring your Bible, you're bored and you're ready for me to hoop and take it home. But in verse chapter 26 and verse 31, then said Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. As it is written, I will smite, smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I am risen again, I will go be before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. He should have been listening. Some people don't listen. They pause when you talk, but they don't listen. Jesus said, it is written that they're going to smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. They should have listened. He should have listened and he didn't. And Jesus said to him, and then Jesus said, verily I say unto you that this night. See, you're overconfident, Peter. You've become a legend in your own mind. This night before the cock crow Thou shalt deny me three times. Peter said unto him, Yes, Lord. No, he didn't. Peter said, Though I should die with thee. And he meant it. He meant it. Yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also, not just Peter, said all the other disciples. Oh, Lord, no, we're not. No, not us. Not us. And uh, it gets worse. With all of that bravado, when you read on, you'll see where Jesus took Peter, yeah, James, and John and said, just watch with me while I pray. And they couldn't even do that. They fell asleep while Jesus was praying. Can I get a witness? Amen. And then we see Peter uh, beginning to resort to praise the Lord. He couldn't handle it well. He began to fall apart because he began to resort to uh, human and secular means to fight spiritual battles. John's Gospel, chapter 18, tells us something about Peter. Praise the Lord. John's Gospel, 18. And uh, uh, if you look at a verse, are you following me? 10 through 11. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. <laughs> and the servant's name was Mal uh, Malchus. And uh, Jesus said unto Peter, put up thy sword in the sheath. Uh, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? In other texts he told him, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by it. You can't fight spiritual battles with knives. Uh, he's not handling this chapter in his life well because he was overconfident. He didn't listen and he began to fall apart. Are you praying for me? Then he hits the lowest of the low. Matthew's gospel. I hope you have your Bibles. Chapter 26 and verse 69 tells us something. Now Peter sat without in the palace. A damsel came unto him, saying, Thou wast also with Jesus of Galilee. But Peter, same night, denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him. And, uh, and she said, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied and, and said with an oath, he said, I swear, I do not know the man. See, overconfidence will do that. It'll make you think you're stronger than what you are. You read it when you're not. And then he says, uh, verse 73 says, and after a while came unto him, they that stood by, 
and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them. And thy speech betrayeth thee. You are Galilean. Then he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the blank, 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 blank man. Cussing and swearing, dropping F-bombs and everything else, trying to convince people that he didn't know Jesus. And after he uh, did all of that, all of that, the Bible says, and immediately the cock crowed. And Peter, remembering the words of Jesus, which he said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Oh, he's in a low place. Have you ever been in a low place? All of us have been in a low place. Praise the Lord. Uh, I, I recommend that you read the what happened between Jesus and uh, Pilate, John's Gospel, chapter 18. I won't read it for time because my time is running out. You know, when I try to preach, teach, it takes a little longer. Praise the Lord. And, uh, and while all of this was going on, Peter was not involved very much you couldn't hardly find him he denied jesus john read john 18 15 through 18 and then verse 27 through 25 and you will see it and you also see as i mentioned how they chose jesus barabbas praise the lord also known as barabbas that's matthew 27 15 through 26, we see Peter low, uh, and not only is he low, but he's absent. You can't find him right now. Yes, he's in a bad place. Are you following me? But I'm glad that Jesus loved Peter. I'm glad that Jesus saw what was coming before the time. For we find in Luke's gospel, chapter 22, amen, and verse 31, before all of this went down, Jesus says to Peter, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. He said, but I want to tell you something, Simon, I've prayed for you. Uh -huh, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail thee not. Mm -hmm. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Can I get a witness? He told him that I prayed for you. And now we see Peter so low that he's off the scenes. The devil has seemed like the devil had uh, won the battle. Jesus died on the cross and rose again the third day. Early resurrection morning, Mary Magdalene and Mary, uh -huh, the mother of Jesus, and, and Salome and some other women brought spices to anoint the body of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But when they got there, I'm preaching about forgiveness. They found that the body was not there. The body was gone. And they asked him, why do you seek the living among the dead? And I heard him say something in verse 7 of Matthew 16. Go your way and tell his disciples and tell Peter, good God Almighty, that I go before you in Galilee. He said, tell him to meet me in Galilee. So even though Peter was down, he was not forgotten because Jesus had already prayed for him. Somebody here today, you're down, but I'm here to tell you that you're not forgotten. But we, because we serve a God who knows how to raise you up. We serve a God who knows how to revive you again. Can I get somebody to say, Lord, revive me again? Jesus said, I haven't forgotten about you, Peter. Go tell Peter. 
spoke to that angel go tell him to tell Peter to meet me in Galilee and in John's gospel chapter 21 we find a wonderful reunion verse 15 so when they had dined Jesus said to Simon Peter they're together again now he said Simon son of Jonah lovest thou me more than these and he said yea Lord thou knowest that I love thee and Jesus said unto him feed my lamb sound man bring me up because I'm on my way home and he said to him again the second time Simon Peter Simon son of Jonah lovest thou me and he said to him yea Lord thou knowest that I love thee and he said to him feed my sheep oh Lord and uh, he said to him the third time you see Peter denied him three times and on the third denial Peter went to cussing well Jesus said I want to see if you're going to own me just as adamantly as you denied me so on the third time he said Simon son of Jonah lovest thou me and Peter was grieved and said unto him the third time Peter got upset and the third time he's asked him lovest thou me and he said unto him Lord thou knowest all things and you know that I love you and Jesus said unto him feed my sheep good God almighty and after being with them 40 days Jesus ascended up into heaven and then 10 days later something amazing happened Acts chapter 2 said when the day of Pentecost had fully come they were all in one place uh, with, uh, with one accord and they all got filled with the Holy Ghost and on that day Peter stood up because people thought that they were drunken Peter said uh, we're not drunken as you suppose you know Peter had to feel forgiven because he didn't wait for the others to preach he stood up and said this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel where God said in the last days I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and when Peter started preaching the Bible said Said they were pricked to their hearts and 3,000 souls got saved and joined the church good God almighty and the church had exploded a new movement was in town and guess what happened a couple of days later they were on their way to prayer and there was a man who was laying by the gate called beautiful man by the beautiful gate lame impotent he'd been there for years the man couldn't walk good god almighty and peter and john walked up to that man and the man said give me something the man said arms can you give me a dime can you give me a peter a penny and peter looked at that man fastened his eyes upon him and said silver and gold have I none but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk Peter grabbed him by the hand the man's feet and ankle bones received strength and he leaped up and he stood he walked in the temple with Peter and John and he was walking and leaping and praising God the people that sophisticated crowd that educated crowd was looking at that man they had the knowledge of the scripture but they didn't have power to heal they had the knowledge of the scripture but they couldn't help the man and here is the man standing there with an ex-fisherman the man is standing there with Peter James and John healed and the and Peter was watching them look at the man so Peter began to preach and he said to them in our text 
He said, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hallelujah, have glorified his son, Jesus Christ, whom you delivered up, and notice this, whom you denied. Now, I just showed you where Peter denied him three times, but because he'd been forgiven, because he'd been washed from his sins, he wasn't bound by it, he wasn't bothered by it, he was free to preach the gospel, he was free to tell the truth, and he told it, and I'm here to tell you, I don't care what you've done, if the Lord have set you free, cry loud and spare not. If the Lord have forgiven you, walk in that forgiveness. Shout in that forgiveness. Leap in that forgiveness. Live in that forgiveness. Yeah! I want to hear some people praise him like you've been forgiven. Hey! Hey! your neighbor by the hand and say neighbor I've been forgiven you, you maybe maybe you maybe you saw me maybe you saw me when I fell to my knees oh Lord maybe you remember when I was a devil oh Maybe you remember when I was out there in a world of sin. But look at me now. I'm clean. I'm free. I'm free indeed. I'm free to walk in the newness of life. I'm free to go to the abortion clinic and win the laws. I'm free. I don't care if I was incarcerated. I can now go back into the prison and say I was just like you. But the Lord brought me out. I don't care what you've been in. If the Lord have set you free, thank God for your freedom. Thank God for your deliverance. Oh, thank the Lord. Lord, Lord, I thank you. Woo! He could preach that they denied Jesus, and you won't read. In any of Peter's sermons or of any of his writings where he mentions how he denied Jesus. For he had been set free. He was forgiven. You got to accept God's forgiveness. You got to walk in forgiveness you you can't beat yourself up and let somebody else beat you up now i'll tell you what you got to do first of all you got to be convicted and you got to feel bad about it <laughs> hallelujah glory to god but when you've given it to jesus there's nothing else you can do with it the devil put out a lie i've heard preachers say it I've heard preachers who've been delivered from drugs and stuff like that say, unless you've been on drugs, you ain't qualified to preach to me. That's a lie from the pit of hell. 
And then sometimes the devil work on people because they've done things. The devil tells them, you're not qualified to talk about it because you did it. And if you talk about it and you preach against it and you know you did it, then that makes you a hypocrite. That does not. That does not make you a hypocrite. No, it means that you've accepted the Lord's forgiveness. It means that you're walking in it. And it means that you're free to show others and to tell others that our God is a forgiving God. Our God breaks yokes. And when you've been forgiven, you ain't got to still be shy. Oh, I would get back on the choir. Oh, I would get back in the church. Oh, I would do this, that, or the other. But the church know how I messed up. Well, you, you're not the only ones who messed up. Everybody's messed up. Some people's mess up is known. Some people's mess up is unknown. But everybody's messed up. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we lie. Praise the Lord. We're all recipients of the Lord's grace and of the Lord's forgiveness. And this man told him, you denied him. He didn't say we denied him. Because the, the, the time that he references in the text in his sermon, he had denied him also. Right, right, right. He, he had already cussed us out on him. <laughs> but he said, you did it. And God used him. And he, he seized God for who he is now. The Lord told me to tell you, walk in your forgiveness. Oh, Amen. And the Lord... The Lord told me to tell you to understand when other people walk in theirs. So you, you're sitting there still upset with them, and you're wondering why they're shouting and acting like they haven't done anything. Well, it's that they've gotten forgiven. I wouldn't give them the dance floor. They can have some of it. But I'm going to shout too. If you can shout and dance because you've got God has forgiven you and you've gotten over what you did, and I, I don't have any, I don't, I don't know of any particular situation. The Lord gave me this to just preach, so I'm not preaching to anybody. I'm preaching to everybody. But if that person can shout, then you ought to come down here and shout. Say, because if you can shout and you did it, I know I can shout because I was the one that was done too. And, and, I, and, and if God can forgive you, so can I. Hit me. I want to accept my forgiveness, preacher. I want to walk in this freedom, preacher. Because we got work to do. Souls to save, devils to cast out. We got work to do. I want to walk in forgiveness. I want to serve in forgiveness. I want to forgive. This is some altar call to make. This is the kind of altar call that you get. If you get three, you're doing good. Because nobody, these, there are certain sins. There's certain things that people don't respond to readily. But there are wives who need to forgive their husbands. Husbands who need to get, forgive their wives. Friends who need to forgive their friends. Friends who need to forgive their enemies. <laughs> people who need to forgive. You're being held. You're being locked. People who need to forgive themselves. You did wrong. The devil, the devil have a way of bringing up everything, especially when you try to do right. The devil have a way of bringing up everything in your life that you've done wrong and, and know how to try to trouble you with that stuff. You got to know that that's the devil. You know, you're that's the devil. You got you to walk in forgiveness. Preacher, you preach to me today. Meet me at the altar. Meet me at the altar. Hallelujah. Come quickly if you're going to come. Can't come slow. Come quickly. I want to walk in God's forgiveness. There are some things I need to let go of. Things I need to release. Things I need to let go of. Praise the Lord. Amen. When I close it, ain't nobody going to slip up later. Uh, amen. That's pretty, but since they sang it so much at prisons, at funerals, change that one. Amen. 
I start, I start, when I hear I'm free, I start looking for, for the body. Amen. <laughs> they messed the song up. Amen. You got to let it go. Some of us secretly, we're carrying things and you got to let it go. You got to let it go. Because if you don't, it makes you bitter. It brings shame that you don't deserve. Let me tell you why. Because we're all ashamed. Yes, right. That's right. We're all ashamed. I said we, we are all ashamed. We are all ashamed. It wasn't for Jesus. It wasn't for Jesus. We all would be ashamed. Uh, because we've done shameful things. And the Lord repaired us and sanctified us. And God can sanctify you to the point where you look like you've never done anything wrong. Now, you can look like you've never done anything wrong. Where you go wrong is when you begin to act like you've never done anything wrong. See, you can look like you've never done anything, anything wrong all you want, but you mess up when you act like you've never done anything wrong because now you don't have the appropriate mercy and grace toward others. And then you hold them. You know how some people, they ain't going to never let you forget your lowest point. Even trying to compliment you. Yeah, it's so good to see you. I'm so proud of what the Lord is doing in you. All these years later, because I remember when you were nothing. I remember when you were this, they just, they just bring it up. And you're looking at me, trying to smile and be nice. So why is it every time they talk to me? They have to always go back to that. Oh, yes, you got to always go back to my lowest point. Read Peter's writings. See if he ever went back to that. Right, right, right. Oh, no, I mean, they're done, done with that. He, he was too busy trying to encourage folk to serve the Lord and telling them, think it not strange, concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Welcome back, Mother. Did you enjoy your trip? Oh, you have a ball. She's been all over in Europe and everywhere. You look good. Missed you. Glad to see you. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God. Lift your hands right now. Lord Jesus, we come before you. Those who are streaming live, pray with us. Because you're going to let some things go today. You're going you're gonna to forgive. And you're going to accept the Lord's forgiveness. Understanding that unless you forgive, you cannot be forgiven. You can't be a forgiven person holding a grudge. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The key to being forgiven is to forgive. And then it just sets you free. Whew. You exhale. Hallelujah. Father, we stand before you. And Lord, we, first of all, we release everyone. We release. I hear the Holy Ghost. Sometimes I pray and minister at the same time. I can't help it. It's the way the Lord deals with me. Somebody just said, what if they don't ask you for forgiveness? So what? That's not a requirement for you to forgive. You certainly do forgive. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. The implication is not if he doesn't repent, don't forgive him. The point is to forgive. When, Jesus, when Peter asked Jesus how many times a day shall we forgive the person, he thought it was being generous with seven. Jesus said, no, uh, 490 times. Whether they repent or not. So well, I ain't going to let it go until they act. It helps. God knows it helps when somebody acknowledges. Woo. But if they don't, you can't give them that kind of power. I just, I can't, there's a lot of things I can give you, but I can't give you that. I can't let you keep me hurt. I can't let you hold me hostage. But Lord, don't they understand what they did to me? They may not. Don't they understand how bad it hurts? They may not. Right. Still got to let it go. Still got to let it go. 
so you can be free. Father, whether the forgiveness is asked for or not, we forgive. And not only do we forgive, Lord, today, but we accept your forgiveness. And we accept the freedom that comes with it. Where we can stand as Peter stood. And even preach against sin. That we've fallen short of. That we've fallen into. And still declare the truth of God. Hallelujah. Where we're able to stand. Without guilt. Without being under the servitude. Of a deed that we can't go back and change. That we're free from it. We stand free. We give it up. We accept your love. We accept your forgiveness. We accept your grace. We accept it for ourselves. And we offer it to those who have offended us. For Lord, I'm often reminded, I remind myself that I've never offended anyone. That no one has ever offended offended me Lord the way that I have offended you no one has ever sinned against me the way I have sinned against you and you forgave me so Lord I forgive them and then Lord we pray that those whom we have sinned against that they forgive us for our sake and more so for their own. We see the bridge. We see the connection. May we be a congregation, a congregation, a congregation of people who have forgiven each other. People who have let it go. Have let it go. Have let it go so that the atmosphere can be clean. So that our church services will be grand. So that our home life will start over. So that our dreams will be sweet. And our food will taste good. And the tenseness and the tension that is in our bodies as a result of holding grudges will release. So that the hypertension will go away. So that the migraines will dissipate so that the adverse effects of walking in unforgiveness will be eliminated so that we can look each other in the eye with clear eyes glory to God and love one another in the name of Jesus so that we can look at each other and not see each other through the prism of their error. So that you can look at the person who lied on you and not see a liar, but see a friend. Look at somebody who did you wrong and not see the person who wronged you, but see a fellow child of God. The Lord said what will help us in this endeavor is that the same, there's someone else who has the same assignment when it comes to you. Somebody else is looking at you and thinking that you did them wrong. Whether you know you did or not. Whether you meant to or not. And God wants them to see you right. So if we all do it. Oh, do you feel the air? If you all, if we all do it. We'll all be clean. We'll all be forgiven. We won't be under the bondage and the obligation and the weight of this thing. I hear the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. Families. There, there are generational things going on. Generational resentments. Sibling rivalries. Bitterness over divorces. Bitterness over arguments. 
hear the Holy Spirit saying, uh, the, some people have the spirit of the Hatfields and the McCords. You've been feuding so long that you don't even remember why the feud even started in the first place. God says today, let it go. Let it go. Walk in the newness of life. Well, what do they have to do for me to let it go? Nothing. Well, why should I let it go? Because of what Christ did on the cross. Lord, there are things in all of our lives that if we had to do over, we would do differently. But there are no do-overs. So Lord, give us the ability to forgive ourselves, to accept your forgiveness, to forgive others, to have others to forgive us, and let us walk, 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 walk in the newness of life. In Jesus' name. Just worship right here. There's a newness coming. See, in this newness, you're going to be healed. Some of the healings hadn't taken place because there's fallow ground. Unforgiveness has been there. Resentment has been holding up your blessing. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. And when I say resentment, some of us have resentment against ourselves. One of the, one of the tricks to becoming righteous is, and it's good, but you can't let it go too far. When you look back on your own self and you're able to, it takes spiritual growth to say, what a wretch I was. What a wicked person I've been. It's easy to see the wretch that someone else was. But what a wretched individual I've been. And the Lord forgave me. But now that then the Lord says, now after I've forgiven you, your next move is to forgive yourself. And then when there's someone else, when you see somebody else, you got to forgive them. Because their sin against you is just a penny. Our sin against God was a million dollars. I'm forgiven. In Jesus' name, thank God. Worship, worship. Ah, when, you, when, you, when you forgive, you... I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. Once you get delivered. Well, well, well. Gone are the dark clouds. That had me bound, had me blind. It's going to be a bright, well, Lord, a bright, sunshiny day. Ah, woo it's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. I'm forgiven. One more thing. I can see clearly now. My sin is gone. Ha. I can see life better. Ha. I see all the obstacles in my way. I got my sight back. I got my sight back. Come all the dark clouds well well that held me down ah it's gonna be a bright it's gonna be a bright sunshiny day my life is better got my joy back and wow oh, gonna be a bright it's gonna be a bright sunshine Stay right there. Somebody clap your hands and say, It's gonna be a bright, bright sunshine day. It's gonna be a bright, my sin.
sins are gone. Yeah. Don't be upright. Don't live a happy life. Hey now. Worship the Lord right there. Uh, uh. And you know what? Because Peter was forgiven, he preached, got the keys to the kingdom, and he remembered something that Jesus told him. Jesus said, Peter, the day will come when another shall carry you. Uh-huh. And uh, you going to go to a place where you don't want to go. And they're going to hang you just like they're going, to do, they're, they're, they're going to do me. And when the time came, Peter said, I got just one request. I don't want y'all to not crucify me because I, I'm, I'm not afraid of that. Jesus told me that was going to happen. But I'm not worthy to be crucified right side up like my Lord was. Would y'all just hang me upside down? See, when you get forgiven, you realize that it's all about Jesus. And you want him to get all of the glory and all of the honor. Can I hear the praises, the worship, and the glory of God? You who are streaming, people everywhere, praise the Lord who has forgiven you. Praise the one who set you free. Ah! Somebody with your forgiven self. Find somebody, hug them. <laughs> 